So it's great to be here tonight. Uh, is everybody ready to hear about some salmon? Whoa, yeah, okay. So um, I'm going to try to operate this. He said, hold it down until it turns blue. And then it's going to drop into my presentation. Right? Okay, try it again. Um, anyway, so uh, while I was listening to that presentation about Alex, I was thinking about Frank, who was doing some communications in advance of this meeting. And I was thinking, you know, Alex is probably going to have a new algorithm that says, do you really want to go do coffee with that guy? Anyway, okay, so I, as Nick said, I'm Jacques White. I'm the executive director of Long Live the Kings. We're a 30-year-old organization, almost 30-year-old organization that's focused on recovery of wild salmon and steelhead and supporting sustainable fishing. Um, so is this going to go on its own forward? No, you click it. Okay, so um, one of the things that we, the right button, right? Okay. Uh, how about I just do go manual here? Okay, so um, one of one of the uh, tribal leaders around here that's very focused on on uh, tribal treaty rights and fishing rights was a guy named Billy Frank Jr. He passed away last year, but he was always saying that there's more to salmon than just catching them. They're actually an indicator of the health of the ecosystem in our region, including um, oh the animations aren't in there either. Oh, you, okay. Well, that's okay. So in addition to people who like to have salmon, and salmon are an indicator of the health of the environment, and we think that's important for future generations, they're also important for orcas. I had a beautiful black and white shot of an orca eating a salmon. Our southern resident killer whales have to have Chinook salmon in order for them to survive. So salmon recovery is an indicator and, and directly supports a lot of elements in the ecosystem. But our salmon are in trouble. We have three species of salmon in our area that are listed under the Endangered Species Act, which means that they're close to going extinct. We might never see them again if we're not successful in bringing those back. So one of the reasons for that problem is something called marine survival or poor marine survival. So this graph shows uh, the marine survival or how many uh, adults, what well, the percentage of juveniles that go out into the environment that come back as adults and how that's changed over time in rivers in Puget Sound and the Strait of Georgia. I'll show you a map later so you know where that is. Versus rivers on the coast of Washington and British Columbia. So you can see that around 1990, marine survival fell off dramatically in Puget Sound and the Strait of Georgia. But on the coast, there's really no trend. It just uh, fluctuated up and down. This is really bad because we're at the point now where a 1% increase in this marine survival could double the number of salmon coming back. It's so low. This is a real problem for salmon managers. So our organization, oh, the map isn't there either. Okay, anyway, the Strait of George is up there in Canada, and Puget Sound's down here. It's what you look at when you look out in the bay. Um, our organization partnered with a, another nonprofit organization in Canada called the Pacific Salmon Foundation, and we started a program called the Salish Sea Marine Survival Project. This is a really uh, big effort, $20 million. We have recruited 40 different organizations to participate in this over the next five years, including government agencies, including research universities, including Indian tribes and First Nations, corporations and, and nonprofit organizations. And the questions that we're trying to answer are, what caused the decline in these salmon and what's keeping them from coming back up? In the ocean, you can see that the marine survival is fluctuating over time. In the Salish Sea, which is what we call the, the combined waters of Puget Sound and British Columbia, it's just going down. So um, what we have is that sa juvenile salmon, we know, are deeply affected by changes in climate. That affects the timing, the abundance, and the type of food resources available for salmon. But salmon are also affected in the, in the marine environment by toxics, by diseases, and by predators like other fish and harbor seals. So for the rest of this talk, I'm going to be focusing on the impact that harbor seals have on salmon and how, this is the tech part, how we're figuring that out. So uh, I just showed you that salmon and steelhead are, are declining in the marine waters. At that same time, harbor seal populations have been almost exploding here. Now, correlation is not causation. How are we going to figure this out? A brilliant uh, uh, graduate student at the University of British Columbia has developed a technique to measure this predation in the environment. And the way he's doing it is he's using something called a pit tag, which is a passive transponder that you can insert in a fish. It's very small. And it, as it goes by an array in a stream that actively 
can sense its presence, you can count those fish and know how, how many went by. These things are inserted into hatchery fish and wild fish in order to trace the health of populations. Well, there are also handheld devices that you can use to identify these transponders. Um, so his idea, oh man, the, you really missed the animation. So the animation would be there's a little fish that jumps into his mouth and then there's a little signal that goes up. So he worked with a company called Wildlife, um, uh, so anyway, this, this, this device is designed to count fish in a seal in the environment, send the data to a satellite, and send that back to your computer at your desktop. So you can measure seal predation in situ. Is it working? <laughs> well, that's, this is the old-fashioned kind of animation. You kind of have to do it. But yeah. so, so this graduate student, Austin, he approached a company in, Red, in Redmond, Washington, called Wildlife Computers, and said, can you devise one of these for me? And they did. And they came up with something that looks like the bellhop's cap in Grand Budapest Hotel, right? But this device actually uh, has a GPS in it. It has a sensor, so when a, uh, the, the seal eats one of these tagged fish in the environment, it sends a signal to a satellite, and that comes back to your desktop. So we tested this at the Vancouver Aquarium, and what we found is that uh, we looked at swallowing time, detection rates for different sized tags, how long is the battery going to last, and what happens when a fish swims by the beanie rather than swimming down the gullet. And what we found is that Readings on this depends on how big the tag is. A bigger tag, you get a better signal. Um, it looks like swallowing time takes a lot longer than a fish swimming by on average. That's good because we can tell the difference between swallowing and not swallowing. And uh, so, so now we're in the process of developing the feasibility testing. Uh, or we just finished the feasibility testing, and now we're going into controlled field test. This controlled field test will uh, look at things like confirming that works with, works with wild seals, testing the satellite transmission, and we actually have an accelerometer built into this thing, so when the seal opens its mouth to eat a salmon, it turns the signal on, and when it closes its mouth, it turns it off after, it's, after a period of time to save the battery. So seals aren't the only thing. This is just a very small part of this overall research program. If you would like to learn more about it, please, uh, the Marine, Salish Sea Marine Survival Project, please go to our site and uh, you can, you can uh, learn all about the other things that Long Lives at Kings are doing. I have a bunch of materials out on the table. Um, let's see, I guess, I guess the one thing I want to say is that this is not, we're not a startup organization. What's important to, to us is where we end up, and we hope that's saving salmon and steelhead. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes, right here. Okay, they, they, they use a, a glue which is um, uh, water soluble on the fur and it, it, it lasts a certain period of time and there's a piece of Velcro on that and so the hat is stuck on the Velcro onto the patch and it falls off the seal's head after about a month in the environment. Right here. Yeah, you know, there's, um, seals like fish and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be trite. Uh, uh, there, there actually has been a huge decline in herring in Puget Sound and in the Strait of Georgia. And so what we think is that maybe um, salmon are looking more attractive because their main food resource, which are these little forage fish, have, are in decline. Uh, another question. Yeah, right here. Yeah, that is, that, is, that is a great question, and it's actually a very complicated one. And the, the reason I say that is that um, on top of the fact that we're trying to recover these species, we have very large hatchery production, which can be helpful to wild fish recovery. It can also be harmful if you do it wrong. We also have something called treaty rights with the, the local uh, native tribes. There are about 25 tribes that have legal treaty rights, and we those treaty rights aren't very valuable to them if they can't fish. And so we have to produce what is at least half of what was historically present to meet those legal treaty rights. So we have the Endangered Species Act in our effort to save the ecosystem and feed the whales butting up against tribal treaty rights. And this is where our work really is. I mean, this, this technical exercise is a part of what we do, but what we really try to do are to solve these problems 
where we're discussing how to use these resources best, how to pool efforts to make sure that we have positive outcomes for all of the user groups, and then work with folks like you all to educate you about what's going on.